community engagement and some of the research that we have engaged in, uh, and the approaches that we take for monitoring and reporting mosquitoes, uh, mosquito abundance and disease prevalence, and then wrapping up with our current mosquito control practices and what is coming up on the horizon for the future of mosquito control in California and Alameda County. So Alameda County Mosquito Abatement Districts uh, is, is tax funded uh, and it was initiated in the San Francisco Bay uh, because of the two species of mosquitoes shown on the right, Aedes dorsalis and Aedes squamager. Those mosquitoes grow in the marsh habitats that ring the San Francisco Bay, and they can fly 10, 20 miles uh, up into the hills to, uh, to bite animals before they fly back to the marshes and lay eggs. And these are voracious biters. If you've ever been to a park where these mosquitoes are not being controlled, uh, they are out during the daytime, during the evening, and they are very aggressive, as was shown by that video, uh, historical video from the 1950s of people trying to play golf up in the East Bay Hills being attacked by those mosquitoes. Uh, mosquito control districts in the San Francisco Bay area uh, were beginning to be formed over 120 years ago by civic, scientific, and business leaders uh, who organized the very first mosquito districts. Uh, the uh, women in the San, San Rafael Improvement Club uh, were foundational in organizing uh, their mosquito control district during 1902. So there's been a longstanding footprint for mosquito control in California. 107 years ago in 1915, uh, the Mosquito Abatement Act of California was signed by the governor at the time. And this is what provides uh, mosquito abatement districts and vector control districts with many of the powers that they have today for controlling mosquitoes. Uh, it authorizes the government to take any and all necessary or proper actions to prevent the occurrence of vectors and vector-borne diseases. And so it gives uh, mosquito abatement and vector control districts the power to tax, to form boards, uh, and abate, which is a way to impose, impose fines for mosquito control. And this act has been incorporated into the California Health and Safety Code, uh, which I've excerpted in that uh, section 2063 below, which gives us the power to, uh, to uh, levy a civil penalty uh, of up to $1,000 per day for the owner of a property that fails to comply with our requirements for mosquito control. However, uh, our district has never charged or fined any property owner to the best of our, what, from what we can find in our historical records. So although we have the power to do so, uh, we choose to uh, involve, to utilize public engagement to really motivate uh, mosquito control in Alameda County rather than forcing the issue with fines. Uh, our special district is an independent special district, uh, and that was formed uh, 92 years ago. And it was really formed by people that were repurposing farm tractors. Uh, the civil engineers took these tractors and they used them predominantly to modify marsh habitats so that mosquito growth was limited. And their primary purpose here was to increase the circulation of water in these marsh habitats so that mosquitoes don't have a habitat uh, to grow in. And this was all born out of these early organizations um, such as the San Rafael Women's Club. Now in California, we have two types of special districts. We have what are called uh, independent special districts, which we are of that type. Uh, it's locally elected or appointed by an independent board which oversees district functions. The other type of special district is a dependent special district, and we have another 
a special district in the county that takes care of controlling all of the other vectors, uh, such as rats, flies, ticks, and fleas. Uh, that's Alameda County Vector Control. They're what's called a dependent special, di special district, and their governing board or council uh, of a city or county serves as the depend as the decision makers. So although uh, they are they serve they're governed in different manners, they all have the same role um, protecting the public health of the residents and the people who, uh, who visit Alameda County. Our board of trustees is made up of 14 people that are appointed by their city council. Uh, so each city has a person on our uh, board of trustees. We also have a county at large uh, person uh, that's appointed, and that is typically the, uh, well, has historically for us been the agricultural commissioner for Alameda County. And so each city has represent, uh, representation on our board of trustees. Our funding uh, comes from uh, primarily property taxes. And so what I'm showing you here in the upper left is my property tax bill uh, for my house in Castro Valley. And you can see that uh, I pay every six months $1.74 for mosquito control. Uh, and then another $2.50 every six months for mosquito control as well. So that's about $6 a year that, um, that I pay uh, as a special assessment for mosquito control. And uh, when you add that up, uh, that takes in about uh, $2 million a year. In addition to, uh, to that funding, uh, we receive uh, an ad valorem property tax of a very, very small percentage of the assessed value, uh, bringing up our total funds for uh, the year, for each year to be at about $4.9 million that we have to uh, control mosquitoes in Alameda County. Uh, we keep a very lean staff. Uh, we believe that technology and innovations are, and public engagement are the best ways to motivate effective mosquito control. And so we have a fifth, we have 18 full-time staff and five uh, seasonal staff that do all the con mosquito control work for uh, Alameda County. Uh, we have nine. Uh, staff in the field that are actually applying uh, insecticides and they're supported by two seasonal staff. In the laboratory, we have three uh, full time staff that do the monitoring along with support from seasonal staff. We have outreach and then administrative support as well. And that's what makes up all of the staff to do all of the mosquito control in Alameda County. And there are a lot of species of mosquito in Alameda County that we need to uh, focus our efforts on. In California, there are uh, there are 53 uh, species that that have occurred in the state for the past 50 years. We call these the native species of California. Most recent, more recently, we've had three non-native species become established in California. Uh, and these are the invasive 80s mosquitoes that you probably have heard about. Uh, but in Alameda County, we have only 22 species uh, uh, that, uh, that are uh, resident in our county. And these are all native mosquitoes. We don't yet, we haven't yet detected the invasive 80s mosquitoes. If there's one big point I'd like everyone to walk away from today with is that only female mosquitoes bite. Um, male mosquito, and you can tell the difference between the two because um, if you're just looking at them with your eye, you can see that male mosquitoes have feathery antennae and female uh, mosquitoes have antenna that are thinner. Additionally, female mosquitoes will fly towards you uh, where because they're uh, looking to bite you. A male mosquito has no interest in flying towards you. Um, it's just more interested in finding a female mosquito. 
Additionally, I'd like you to take away from today that mosquitoes have an obligate, obligate aquatic phase of their, of their life cycle. And what this means is that a good portion of mosquitoes life cycle is spent uh, growing inside of water. So at the top of this uh, cartoon are uh, the female and male adult mosquitoes. Uh, when, a mos when a female adult mosquito bites an animal and takes blood, it uses that blood uh, as a protein source to produce eggs. And those eggs are then, she then lays those eggs onto um, the surface of water, or sometimes she'll glue eggs on plants or other substrates that are next to water. And uh, those eggs will eventually hatch to produce larvae. And these are, uh, these larvae um, filter the water and they filter out particles or bacteria uh, from the water and that's their food. Something that's really interesting about uh, these larval mosquitoes is that unlike most aquatic insects, uh, they breathe air at the surface. So that little, uh, that little pr uh, projectile that's at the top of that cartoon of the larvae, that's its siphon. And that's what it puts through to the surface of the water. And it breathes through that, through that air siphon. So it's breathing air out of the atmosphere. These larvae uh, then go through a, a development phase where they become pupae uh, once they're large enough. And then these pupae, after a period of time, will uh, develop to form adults that then uh, come out of the water and begin flying around and harassing all of us. And we have a lot of mosquito producing habitats in Alameda County. Uh, the native mosquitoes uh, that we have, they can grow in these really large salt marshes. This is in fact where we spend a great deal of our effort on mosquito control is in these salt marshes to uh, knock down uh, those, uh, those species of mosquitoes that grow there. They grow in tules, they grow in storm canals and creeks. These are all natural settings, but many of these species can take advantage of uh, of hard, of gray infrastructure such as unmaintained swimming pools or ornamental ponds to produce mosquitoes that can be highly abundant in localized residences and so residential communities. And so when we find these ornamental ponds or unmaintained swimming pools, we make a uh, very strong effort to eliminate those mosquito growth, those sites where mosquitoes can grow. Now, the invasive mosquitoes, uh, the Aedes aegypti uh, that I alluded to a little bit early on, they grow in very different habitats. Um, so Aedes aegypti uh, can grow in very small amounts of water. In fact, a, uh, the larval form of Aedes aegypti can complete its entire life cycle in the larval form in as small of a bottle cap of water. So you can see why when these mosquitoes uh, become established inside of a community, they become very difficult to eradicate because they can grow in tire, in the, in the uh, insert of tires, they grow in utility vaults, they can grow in plant saucers, and they can grow inside of the plants that they naturally evolved to grow in, bromeliad plants. So these are, this is a tropical species that originally developed in the equatorial areas of uh, the world, and they, mat they utilized those natural habitats, bromeliads, for example, for their growth, and now they've just co-opted all the small water containers that we make available to them in our backyards, in our, in our communities. And of course, we are a public health agency, and so we're not just concerned with um, uh, controlling mosquitoes because they are a nuisance. Um, we also control them because they spread arboviruses. The invasive Aedes mosquitoes, Aedes aegypti and Aedes albopictus, which are firmly established in California, they're not going away. Um, 
Those mosquitoes can spread dengue, Zika, yellow fever, and chikungunya viruses. Uh, and these mosquitoes bite predominantly during the daytime. Uh, they can bite at nighttime as well. However, they have a strong preference for biting people over any other animal. And so if you were to have Aedes aegypti in your house and you have your dog or cat or bird, um, that mosquito is much more likely to bite you than it is to bite uh, your pet dog or cat. That's in contrast to the uh, native mosquitoes in California that can transmit arboviruses. These are the Culex species, such as Culex pipiens, Culex tarsalis, for example. They spread diseases like West Nile virus and St. Louis encephalitis virus. They tend to bite during the crepuscular hours, which is during the evening or morning, and they have a strong preference for biting uh, birds, rodents, or other animals over people. So um, there's a much lower risk for transmission of diseases spread by Culex species compared to uh, those spread by the invasive 80s. However, um, I don't talk about it in this slide deck, but the diseases that come with West Nile virus can be very severe and uh, can be life-threatening. So that's in contrast to many of the diseases that are spread by Aedes aegypti and Aedes albopictus. Uh, they have high mortality. They produce, those diseases produce high mortality, typically only in the very young, and so not in adults. Whereas West Nile virus and St. Louis encephalitis virus, those typically hit hardest the elderly. Uh, I mentioned Aedes aegypti when it arrived in California in the southern part um, in the early 2000s. It spread very, very quickly in the southern parts of California and then moved surprisingly fast up through the Central Valley all the way up into Shasta at this point, Shasta County. And this happened all within uh, the period of a decade. We never expected um, Aedes aegypti to spread as rapidly out of the warm parts of Southern California as it did. And we did, certainly didn't anticipate it to arrive uh, up in the far reaches of Shasta and Butte County. And notably, uh, a new uh, member of the Aedes aegypti club in our area is Contra Costa County. Uh, they just detected Aedes aegypti in their area um, over this summertime, and they're trying hard to eradicate it. But as what we've seen in Southern California, and with it's very difficult to eliminate because of the unique habitats that it can occupy in backyard, um, basically backyard uh, uh, saucers or toys that fill with water. And not only do invasive 80s mosquitoes spread diseases, they are extremely aggressive biters. Uh, they are changing the way in which people uh, occupy and recreate in their backyards. There are a lot of um, uh, building permits for what are called Florida rooms, where you screen in your backyard porch, your backyard patio, so that you can escape from these really aggressively biting mosquitoes. So I think we're probably gonna have to start calling those California rooms uh, with the way that Aedes aegypti is spreading throughout uh, our state. So now I wanna transition a little bit more since we've talked about the, um, uh, the how our district was formed, the different types of special districts, and I've given you a little bit of background on mosquito biology and the mosquitoes that we have in California. I do want to talk with you a little bit now about the motivators that we have that drive mosquito control in our district and frankly for all districts within the state. The primary motivation motivators reports from the public. Uh, we have, uh, it's difficult to know where mosquitoes are biting and harassing people unless the public lets us know. 
Um, we also, however, we also monitor for the presence of immature mosquitoes. Those are those mosquito larvae. So our staff are out in areas where we know the mosquitoes can grow. And if we find those immature mosquitoes, we apply products to limit their capacity to produce adults. Of course, uh, when we detect a mosquito-borne disease, that is a strong motivator for mosquito control, as are the detection of biting adult mosquitoes. Once that abundance reaches above a certain threshold, uh, that can trigger uh, enhanced mosquito control efforts. And this is all rooted in the concept of integrated uh, mosquito management. And that's where we use data and institutional knowledge to enact uh, uh, and to enact effective and sustained state sustainable mosquito control. And this can be broken down into proactive and responsive actions. Um, proactive efforts that we invest heavily into our community engagement. We really want the public involved in mosquito control because they're the most affected. And if the public is involved, then we know where the mosquitoes are the biggest problem. We also, uh, uh, another part of integrated mosquito management is to assess mosquito abundance. So we have a very extensive trap network uh, of mosquito traps that we use for monitoring the mosquito, adult mosquito abundance. And our staff are routinely out in the field every day checking the water in areas where we know mosquitoes could grow to see if there are mosquitoes present. And then there are the responsive or incident dependent efforts that we have. These are when we apply uh, chemical products to control mosquitoes. We will also do what's called physical control, which I'll talk a little bit more about that in a moment. Uh, and then uh, up and coming, well, we also use biological control approaches, uh, and there are some new fronts on the biological control horizon that I'm going to share with you a little bit later at the end of today's talk. But first, uh, community engagement is really crucial, and so that's where I want to start. Um, we uh, spend a lot of effort in trying to engage our engage the public and we invite requests for service from the public. We have a request for service intake form uh, shown on the right that we use for recording the location of the caller, um, what the problem is. We try, we make an appointment to visit uh, the person and we typically visit the caller within a day and sometimes the day of, the day that they call. So we are very proactive in our request for service. We take these extremely seriously because we know that uh, if you don't control mosquitoes quickly, they can get out of they can get out of control very fast because their life cycle can be as quick as one week from egg to adult mosquito. And these requests for service is where about uh, one fifth of our staff effort is spent is uh, serving the public in their uh, immediate needs for mosquito control on their property. And uh, this is a map showing our request for service during 2022, 2021, excuse me. Um, we had 830 requests for service. And as I mentioned before, uh, each of these receive an in-person response usually within a day, if not the day that, um, that the uh, request was made. And you can see that we get a variety of requests for service from reporting, reporting a dead bird, which is an indicator of um, a arbovirus being present in the community. Um, uh, someone may request them being bitten by mosquitoes. They may report that they have found water that could be growing mosquitoes. And then they'll also uh, request mosquito fish, which I'll touch on a little bit later. Those are mosquito fish are an important component of our mosquito control program in Alameda County, and it's important for most uh, mosquito control programs in the state. Uh, we really 
focus on community engagement with the public because we believe that it leverages a show me and a discovery mindset. And we found that community engagement really motivates an involved public. So we invite students from universities nearby. For example, these are Cal State East Bay students uh, looking at how we grow those mosquito fish that I alluded to a little bit earlier. We go and we visit uh, preschools and we explain, uh, we uh, go through the mosquito life cycle. We give them uh, little ecosystems that have mosquitoes inside of them so they can see the growth of those mosquitoes over time. Because we know that these kids and their enthusiasm for seeing mosquitoes growing in their school, in their classroom, they bring it home to their parents and that motivates mosquito control in the person's in, in the person's house. So we really focus on kids because we know kids can be such a strong motivator for parents. And then you'll also see us at different symposia or other um, uh, other uh, engagements where we'll put up booths and engage typically with adults that want to know a little bit more about mosquito control and how they can prevent mosquito growth in their community. We also have a, uh, a uh, social media platform, social media engagement, and uh, through Facebook, uh, Instagram, Twitter, we put ads on Google. You might see them every once in a while. We're on Nextdoor. We're actually finding that Nextdoor is one of the most effective ways to engage the public. It can be extremely time intensive to monitor Nextdoor, but we found that this is a very effective platform for getting our message out in a, in a manner that motivates the public to engage with mosquito control. And then, of course, we have a community engagement with our partner agencies and facilities. We work deeply with East Bay Regional Park District because they have a lot of the, they own much of the wildlands that uh, still exist in uh, the county. And so we work deeply with them to, uh, to do mosquito control on their properties. So we coordinate with these land managers and facility managers with MOUs, with East Bay Regional Parks and with US Fish and Wildlife Service. There are some large uh, properties that they manage where we do a lot of mosquito control. We engage in public public agencies such as uh, California Department of Public Health. We have a cooperative agreement with them for uh, collecting cadavers that of, the, of dead birds that we test for, uh, for arboviruses. We report uh, to them our mosquito abundance, which I'll talk about a little bit later. We engage with Alameda County Department of Public Health. We get reports uh, of uh, arbovirus diseases in people in Alameda County so that we can make uh, informed decisions on placing traps in areas where those cases are reported to ensure that um, there is not a spread of diseases such as dengue or malaria in Alameda County. And then um, we also, of course, work with public and private landowners such as EB Mud uh, and their wastewater treatment plants to, um, to do mosquito control work on their properties as well. And also to motivate them to make their properties more resilient to producing mosquitoes. That's really our principal goal. Uh, we prefer not to apply insecticides. We wish for land owners and managers to uh, increase the resilience of their properties so that they don't produce mosquitoes. We also engage with universities and research institutions from uh, UCSF, uh, Chan Zuckerberg Biohub, Berkeley, UCSF, uh, and Davis. We publish uh, scientific research articles on, uh, on mosquito control and some of the other features of mosquito um, monitoring that we develop. 
And on the right are just a few of the more recent publications that we've made uh, with these collaborators. Uh, additionally, we work with a slew of uh, other vector control districts and collaborate with them. Uh, and that's all coordinated, coordinated under the Pacific Southwest Vector and Born Disease Center of Excellence. It's funded by, um, by uh, the United States, specifically the CDC. And so uh, community engagement is, of course, crucial, uh, but so is assessing mosquito abundance. We must know uh, what the mosquito abundance is before we apply any of any of our insecticides. So that's step two is really assessing abundance. And we assess abundance uh, using very simple tools such as what such as a dipper. Uh, that is a white cup on the end of a pole that we uh, scoop water out of. And with that white cup, we can see with our eyes whether there are larvae present. Uh, and if there are, and if they reach above a certain threshold, we can then apply products to limit the ability of those larvae to develop into pupae and then flying and biting and mating adult mosquitoes. And uh, we use these simple technologies for mosquito to monitor larval abundance, but we use uh, pretty more advanced uh, dashboards to collect that data and then visualize it for our mosquito control staff to uh, use for making informed decisions on their mosquito control efforts. So on the right is a map of one of our Power BI dashboards. It uh, shows uh, the larval abundance in the county for the past 15 days, and it's automatically updated uh, every minute. So as soon as someone puts in a new record, that dashboard is auto updated and we can see live uh, in the field with tablets or in the office with our computers uh, where larval abundance is highest. We also use infused water traps to attract invasive Aedes mosquitoes that are looking uh, to lay eggs. I mentioned earlier that these invasive Aedes We'll use any small container of water to lay eggs in. So we'll put in basically decoys out into the field of these uh, of these buckets that contain water. And we'll put in a substrate that will allow the mosquitoes to lay their eggs. That's that little stick uh, that's poking out of that bucket. And you can see when you look very closely at that stick, you can see those little black uh, uh, bacilliform shaped eggs. Those are Aedes aegypti eggs that that mosquito has laid on those papers. And so if we find these eggs, we can test those eggs to make sure that they're actually Aedes aegypti because there's many different species of Aedes that lay eggs that look very similar. We have a genetic test. It's a PCR based test uh, that we can test those eggs, confirm whether they're Aedes aegypti or not and then act appropriately. Fortunately, uh, we have not detected any Aedes aegypti in Alameda County, but we do have these surveillance tools out uh, looking to help us look for them. We also uh, rely extensively upon uh, adult mosquito abundance monitoring. And to do this, we use what's called an EVS or encephalitis virus survey CO2 trap, and that's shown uh, on the left hand side of the slide. Uh, we uh, this trap uses three attractants to bring mosquitoes to the trap. Uh, adult female mosquitoes are strongly attracted by carbon dioxide. So when you're breathing outwards, that's really bringing uh, mosquitoes uh, into you, which is why uh, if you have a bunch of mosquitoes swarming you, Breathing really deeply and trying to shoo them away is usually not the most effective way. They're just going to find you that way. So it's better to just kind of move away from them if you can. They're also strongly attracted to human scents, particularly the smell of uh, stinky socks. 
And um, lactic acid is one of the major components of the odors in people's feet. And so uh, we use lactic acid as a scent attractant. And then lastly, mosquitoes will use uh, light to uh, find uh, to find animals to bite. You know, they've learned over uh, they've learned over you know dozens of years of evolution, uh, dozens of years that uh, lights are where people are, and so they have evolved the ability to use light as a sensor, uh, as a homing sensor to bring them into where people live. And so we use we put those three attack attractants on our trap. A fan sucks them into the trap, and then uh, we have a net that holds those trapped mosquitoes. And then uh, we take that net, we kill the mosquitoes, and then we count and identify those mosquitoes as species. And we, uh, we can then visualize uh, the abundance in our area using a dashboard similar to the one that I mentioned for our larval control. And so this Power BI dashboard that I'm showing you on the right is also up, auto updated uh, uh, every minute. And it shows the prior 15 days of mosquito abundance in pie charts with the, lar uh, with the largest uh, spot indicating the highest abundance and those pie charts broken down by species. And if this is a live demo, I could show you that I could tap on each of those tiles on the left hand side of that map to really drill down on, for example, where Culex tarsalis is located. I can change the tap the tri tap tri trap type and any other parameter that I wish to. So these dashboards are extremely powerful tools that enable us to get a broader perspective of mosquito abundance. Now, that's not the end of what we do with the adult mosquitoes. If the mosquitoes that we collect in these traps uh, are of the species that can transmit uh, arboviruses to people, uh, we take them into the lab and we use our robot, which is shown on the left, to isolate uh, the RNA, which is the genetic material of arboviruses. And then we test that genetic material for the presence of arboviruses using quantitative reverse transcription PCR. And so if we get a, when we get uh, arbovirus, when we get mosquitoes in our traps and we want to know whether or not they have an arbovirus in them, within two hours of receiving that trap, we can have an answer because we have built the capacity in our labs, in our lab to test these mosquitoes very rapidly. And this is crucially important when we are concerned that there might be an outbreak of an arbovirus disease in the county. Fast response times in uh, understanding uh, whether or not mosquitoes are present results in fast times in enacting mosquito control, appropriate mosquito control measures. And all this data doesn't just stay uh, in, our, uh, in our hot little hands. We report this out to the state. There is a statewide reporting system called CalServe. It's housed at UC Davis, and it's where most uh, vector control districts in the state uh, place their, uh, their mosquito abundance and arbovirus prevalence data. And we have over 10 years of high quality data in uh, CalServe that we can use for um, developing predictive models to understand where risks are greatest. And also it serves as a repository for researchers who wish to access our data or frankly any other district's data for their own research projects. And any researcher can request this data. I serve on that committee and I don't believe we've ever declined uh, a request for data that had a good research background to it. <clears throat> so in addition, um, I mentioned CalServe is a way to that districts can uh, submit their data. Um, this data can also be viewed by other districts. So we have agreements with San Mateo, Contra Costa, and Santa Clara 
mosquito and vector control districts where we share our high resolution mosquito abundance data so that I can see today uh, where are the biggest threats on our borders. And also I can use this data to develop predictive models for understanding when we might see changes in our mosquito abundance based on what we're seeing in our neighboring districts. And this is high resolution down to uh, the precise site where that mosquito trap was placed. Now that's uh, that, those are in house uh, that we use for reporting uh, our data, but we also report this data to the public. It's slightly more anonymized in that you, we don't get we don't provide pinpoint accuracy of where our traps were placed, and that's for protecting uh, uh, public information and, and PII, if you will. Uh, but the public can get in here and they can uh, look at the vector serve maps and they can see where what uh, what counties have the highest risk. They can drill down and see what species are the most abundant in those counties. And they can do that for every county in California. And you can see that there are other uh, states that participate as well, such as Arizona and Utah. Uh, New Jersey is not on this map, but um, they're they're there as well. We can also see our virus prevalence and we can uh, zoom in by year and locale. And this is also reported to the public as well. So it's publicly available data as well. So we have a lot of internal data, but we highly value transparency and uh, we report out to the public in a manner that uh, protects public privacy, but also engages public interest in uh, mosquito uh, control efforts in their communities. So now I want to transition to uh, how the approaches that we take for controlling mosquitoes. And uh, we prefer to control mosquitoes before they fly. We prefer to control them in their aquatic phases. Why? It's They're easier to find. Uh, larvae and pupa are contained by water. If we see water, we can dip the water, see if there's larvae, and if there are, we can apply products if necessary. There, some water containers are pretty easy to eliminate in the absence of uh, pesticides. If they're small, you can just dump and drain them. And by small, even the size of a swimming pool, you can eliminate the water in a swimming pool, and that eliminates the abilities, the ability of mosquitoes to reproduce there. Moreover, larvae are very unlikely to be infected by a human pathogen. So if we control them before they become an adult, uh, that is a big, uh, big boost in protecting public health. And lastly, they're very susceptible to biopesticides that have a very targeted effect on mosquito larvae and do not affect uh, other aquatic insects except for black fly, black fly larvae, which are also another nasty biting insect that some vector control districts uh, do work to control as well. So many of the, most of the, I'm gonna say all of the products that we use in water are very, are very specific to mosquitoes and to a lesser extent, black flies. So now I'd like to transition into some of the ways that we control mosquito larvae. And I'm going to touch on chemical control, physical control, and biological control. So um, we, for our mosquito control, uh, our proactive arm, we focus on maintaining water circulation channels in, in marsh habitats. I touched on that at the very beginning of our of today. Uh, we provide mosquito fish to residents in, their, in our service requests. And in our outreach, we motivate dump and drain practices in the public. This is our staff out in the marsh uh, clearing out a water circulation channel uh, that we know is very effective at helping to reduce uh, the amount of standing water in these marshes and uh, limit the ability of mosquitoes to grow in these vast landscapes where in the absence of this effort, um, people in Alameda County 
would not be very happy about living nearby or with e even within a few miles of a marsh because these mosquitoes can fly very long distances. Another aspect of our, uh, of our control program is, as I mentioned, is providing mosquito fish. Uh, Gamb Gambusia athens is the species that we provide. We deliver them to anyone who asks them for free. Uh, we just ask that you put a bucket out in front of your house, give us a call, and we'll pour mosquito fish into that bucket for you to place into your backyard if you want guidance on how to take care of your mosquito fish. We'll go into your backyard and walk you through it. These mosquito fish love to eat mosquito larvae. They're relatively small, uh, no more than three inches in length, and they live in shallow fresh water. So they can grow really well in backyard ornamental ponds, swimming pools, uh, and they can live in very low oxygen water, such as those ornamental ponds that I just mentioned. Even better, um, we, we try to encourage people to stop mosquitoes from laying eggs in water. So if you have, if you don't need water features in your background, in your backyard, uh, eliminate them. If there are buckets of water that you're using, uh, try to eliminate them. Uh, so we try to motivate the public to dump drain and scrub outdoor containers. Now, when those measures don't work, then we go into our mosquito control mode where we apply larvicide or adulticide. And then um, this is our reactive phase of mosquito control. And then on the horizon that I'm gonna touch on is this sterile insect technique that is being, uh, is being studied in California for use here. So I mentioned that we use very specific products for controlling mosquito larvae. Uh, they fall into three categories. Uh, we will use uh, insect-specific toxins that are byproducts of bacteria. Uh, uh, the one that we use most commonly is from a bacteria called Bacillus thuringiensis israeliensis. It's short for that is BTI. This bacteria is sprayed onto uh, corn cob, and then we'll, uh, by hand or by machine, disperse that uh, corn cob into water and that toxin, once the mosquito larvae eats that, uh, it kills the larvae. And we'll talk about that in a little bit more detail in a moment. We also use insect growth hormones that are specific to insects. Uh, the one that we use predominantly is methoprene. Uh, and then lastly, we'll use surfactants to control uh, mosquito larvae and the pupal stage which are unfortunately resistant to the bacteria or the hormones. So if we get pupae and we need to control those before they emerge to become adults, we'll use a surfactant. As I mentioned, the most common insect toxin that we and most other vector control districts in uh, the state use is from Bacillus thuringiensis or BTI. BTI is a, uh, is a crystal uh, it, it is made up of several proteins called cry proteins. And mosquito larvae, uh, when they're feeding in the water, they'll ingest these cry proteins. And these cry proteins are converted into a toxin in the mosquito's intestine. And the reason that one thing that imparts the specificity of these cry toxins to mosquitoes is that the intestine of a mosquito is uh, alkaline, so it's basic. Whereas the intestine of animals such as us, uh, our stomachs are acidic. And so cry to proteins or cry proteins are not activated to form the toxin in an acidic environment, only in an alkaline environment, such as what you find inside of uh, the intestine of a mosquito. So the crytoxins are, uh, once they're released from the cryproteins, they bind onto receptors on the surface of cells in the uh, mosquito larvae's intestine. And those, cry pro those crytoxins form fissures on the surface of the cell, and that breaks the cell open and allows pathogens into the mosquito 
uh, the body of the mosquito, and it eventually kills the mosquito larvae by, sexi by sepsis or uh, loss of uh, homeostasis in water regulation. So it's very effective and very targeted for controlling uh, mosquito larvae. Similarly, uh, the insect growth hormone that we use, predominantly methaprene, they also are very specific in their interactions with mosquitoes. So uh, uh, just as a reminder, uh, on the right is the life cycle of mosquitoes with biting adults laying eggs, which hatch to form larvae. Larvae normally develop to form pupae, and the pupae emerge uh, to form biting adults. Methaprene is a small hormone that, uh, that uh, can penetrate through uh, the skin or cuticle of a mosquito, and, in, it, and once it enters into the, the body of the mosquito, it interrupts the normal uh, development of the larval form of the mosquito to form a pupae. So that development does not occur. And when that happens, the mosquito gets either locked into the larval form, it sometimes gets locked into a malformed pupal form, but the upshot of it all is that in the presence of methoprene, uh, mosquitoes cannot, uh, the larval form cannot properly develop to form uh, a to em form an emerged biting adult female. And so that's very effective for controlling mosquitoes in the water. <clears throat> and then the last category of uh, larvicides that we use are surfast surfactants. The one that we use predominantly is called BVA2. <clears throat> As I mentioned, mosquito larvae, uh, they breathe through their siphon, uh, that pokes through to the surface of the water. In the presence of BVA2 at that surface of the water, it disrupts the surface tension, uh, and that breathing tube is not able to really get a clear path through to the air, and as a result, the larvae and the pupae, uh, for that matter, which also breathes at the surface of the water, uh, suffocates. So uh, BVA2 is very effective for that reason. We use several approaches for applying larvicide. We can use a backpack, uh, a backpack blower. We can apply <coughs> larvicides with a truck. Uh, some districts will use airplanes or helicopters. That's very expensive. We will occasionally use helicopters, but uh, just one or just a few hours of that work costs tens of thousands of dollars and hiring out the helicopter. So we prefer not taking that approach. Fortunately, more recently, uh, there are other aerial alternatives for applying, uh, for applying insecticides, specifically drones. And we are using drones now to apply <coughs> larvicide in Alameda County. And there was a question before I started today's presentation on where larvicides are applied in Alameda County. This is another one of our dashboards that shows what products are applied and where they're applied in our district. And so you can see that most of our applications are occurring in the habits, habitats that abut uh, the San Francisco Bay. So um, we're putting most products down where the mosquitoes are most abundant, which is in the marshes. When do we apply larvicides? Uh, well, we apply them most often in the warmer months because uh, insects, like all insects, mosquitoes grow more rapidly when the ambient or environmental temperature is warmer. And so uh, during the warmer parts of the months, they grow more rapidly. And so that requires more, uh, more frequent uh, larvicide applications. <coughs> and you know, we don't have we don't have the market. We don't corner the market on larvicides. You know, you can go to your local hardware store and buy larvicides for yourself to do mosquito control in your backyard. It's the exact same active ingredient. 
Now, one thing that I haven't mentioned yet is the application of adulticides, such as pyrethroids. Um, this is our very last resort for controlling mosquitoes. And in Alameda County, we, uh, we apply adulticide only when there are infected adult mosquitoes. We do not apply adulticide for uh, nuisance mosquitoes, and our larvicides are very effective for controlling the native mosquitoes that we have in Alameda County. However, there are cases where we detect mosquitoes that contain West Nile virus, and when we do, uh, to protect the public from those infected, flying, and biting mosquitoes, we will apply pyrethroids using an ultra-low ultra volume um, mister. And you can see in the graph on the right, from 2011 to 2021, uh, um, you can see from the red, from the red box, the red squares, we have very few detections of West Nile virus in Alameda County. But when we do, and those detections are appreciably high, we will apply uh, adulticide, but in very low quantities. The most that we've sprayed in the last decade is 1.5 square miles. And so if you consider that in contrast to what's done with aerial applications of adulticides elsewhere, it's a very small footprint of adulticide, but it is an essential tool that we have for controlling mosquitoes. And lastly, I just want to transition to some of the to talk uh, about some of the upcoming technologies for mosquito control that are uh, likely to be coming uh, out pretty soon. And this is this these all fall under the umbrella of sterile insects for uh, invasive Aedes control. The principle of this approach is that non-biting males are released, uh, which mate with uh, invasive female mosquitoes to sterilize them so that uh, those female mosquitoes are not able to produce uh, offspring that can that can bite uh, other they can bite people. And there are three main sterile insect techniques that are being considered to reduce abundance of biting and disease spreading female, 80s aegypti mosquitoes. And they are using irradiated uh, mosquitoes, uh, bacteria infected mosquitoes, or genetically engineered mosquitoes. And these are all male mosquitoes that are being released. And remember, male mosquitoes don't bite, female mosquitoes do. So none of these techniques rely upon releasing female mosquitoes, which can bite people. And I'd also just like to point out that none of these technologies are being used in Alameda County because we don't have invasive Aedes mosquitoes. So irradiated male mosquitoes, um, uh, this is a technology that has been long used to control all sorts of uh, insects uh, from medfly and for agricultural protection. Uh, it was used to eliminate screwworm in Africa and it's now being uh, considered for controlling Aedes aegypti. And the idea behind this is that uh, male mosquitoes are sterilized with x-rays. Uh, the machine shown on the right is a machine that's being sold by RadSource. It can sterilize uh, 25,000 male mosquitoes at a time. It can be used for any species, but it's being used now for Aedes aegypti. And the advantage of this technology is it takes a one-time purchase uh, for the equipment. A disadvantage for it is you have to grow hundreds of thousands of mosquitoes, uh, and you have to physically separate the males from the mosquitoes. And there are some technologies that uh, make that easier. Uh, however, it's not 100% effective, so often there's a low proportion of females uh, that end up being released as well. Another disadvantage of this technology is that it can reduce the health of the mosquito, so they may not be able to fly as far. However, because this is an unpatented technology, 
and it takes a one time purchase. There are some districts in Southern California that are moving forward uh, to test this technology in their areas, specifically Orange County Mosquito and Vector Control District have bought one of these machines and they're in the process of installing it now to uh, test whether it can be effective for controlling the Aedes aegypti that they have in their district. Another technology, another sterile insect technology is to release mosquitoes that are infected with uh, Wabakia. Uh, Wabakia is a bacteria that when male mosquitoes are infected with it and they spread it to a female mosquito, if it's the right species of, of Wabakia, it will prevent that female mosquito from producing fertile eggs. And so uh, that technology uh, is uh, pretty effective. It's been, uh, it's been studied in California, in Fresno. There was a pilot study called the Debug Fresno uh, that was done uh, with Consolidated Mosquito Abatement District in Fresno in partnership with Mosquito Mite mosquito mate uh, company, and they published the outcome of those of those studies, and it proved to be very effective at reducing Aedes aegypti abundance. The advantage of this technology is that the male mosquitoes naturally spread those bacteria. They can spread it to the female. When the female interacts with another male, it can spread it to the male. It can have a multi-generational impact, so if you release one batch of male mosquitoes that are infected with Balbachia, it can, it can uh, that impact will trickle down to multiple generations because those male mosquitoes are long lived and they can, um, they can spread that infection to other female mosquitoes. Importantly, Balbachia infected female mosquitoes, uh, not only do they have a, a reduced ability to produce adult mosquitoes, if they themselves happen to be infected with a virus such as dengue, it inhibits the ability of that virus to grow inside that female mosquito. So it's really, a, it has a knock-on benefit in that realm. Uh, it's already EPA registered and it's a non-genetically modified mosquito option. And it's available in this country already in, in limited markets. A disadvantage remains here that you still must separate the males from the females. You might have to change that strain of Wolbachia. And of course, this is a commercial product provider. And so you have to pay for each batch of mosquitoes that you get from them. And lastly, uh, there are genetically modified mosquitoes. These uh, are very, these are also very effective at suppressing uh, the abundance of Aedes aegypti. This was tested in the Florida Keys. It was controversial, but it was extremely effective in reducing uh, Aedes aegypti abundance in those test sites. And the advantage of this technology is massive. Uh, the female mosquitoes are eliminated in the larval form. So there are no adult female mosquitoes that are released in this with this technology. Uh, it's undergoing an EPA approved, it, it did undergo an EPA approved and monitored trial in Florida. It was successful. It's a super simple technology. Uh, the company sends you eggs in a box, you pour in water and male mosquitoes are released and they sterilize the female mosquitoes. Of course, there is public hesitancy to genetically mod to releasing genetically modified organisms. And again, this comes with a recurring cost. Of course, all of these technologies uh, rely upon hundreds of thousands of male mosquitoes being released, regardless of whatever SIT approach is used. And you just need that type of inundation to really eliminate or knock down uh, native or to knock down Aedes aegypti. Um, Oxitec, which is a company that makes the, uh, the genetically modified mosquitoes, asked for districts in California if they would be willing to host a trial. We offered up uh, Alameda County. We want to know if this technology 
could be effective for controlling Aedes aegypti. And so we said, yes, we'd be willing to participate in a pilot program. We don't have Aedes aegypti, so they did not end up selecting us. However, they are moving forward with a trial in collaboration with Delta Mosquito and Vector Control District in the Central Valley. And that really brings full circle to the integrated mosquito management uh, program that we have in Alameda County Mosquito Abatement District. It's the same plan that's used by all vector control districts in the state. It's part of our strategic plan uh, for, uh, for serving the public uh, in mosquito control. And um, with that, I would like to close and invite questions. <laughs>